everybody. I'm Kate Conroy. And I'm Vanessa Vizzello. And this is Other People's Business, which is the podcast from the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, the largest statewide business association in the entire United States of America. We release a new episode every other Wednesday, so be on the lookout for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were laughing so hard before we started that I actually cleared my throat, and now I'm having to continue to clear it. Uh, shout out to New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. They do home, auto, and workers' comp, so check them out if you'd like some updated coverage. Awesome. I just remembered that it's been so long since we've done this show, like we've actually recorded it, that I don't remember what I'm supposed to say at this point, but we're going to try to wing it. So this podcast is available just about anywhere you can get a podcast. That's iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Student. We even throw these things up on YouTube if you'd rather watch them listen. But no matter how you check the show out, give it some love. Give it that like. Give it that comment. Give it that five-star review on iTunes. Give me some love for getting this like memorized without even looking at the script. Um, but with all that out of the way, our awesome guests today from Career Letters is Mike Farher. So Mike, say hi, let the audience hear your voice. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, shout out to Bill Bronner, who uh, is the person who introduced you to us. Bill Bronner with New Jersey Business Magazine, one of our own. Okay. The so... subject of our last episode of the show. Indeed, think, indeed. Right? I think, yeah, I think it yeah, was the last episode yeah, that he was on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so today's icebreaker is what are you currently binging? And I am happy to go first. Go ahead. Um, as you know, I recently re-binged in anticipation of the final season, uh, Better Call Saul. And then Ooh. I turned my dad onto it. And so my dad hmm. kept, my dad was watching it and he kept referring to it as Let's Call Saul, <laughs> which made me laugh. And he sure, refused. Sure. He kept saying up and down that he was not going to watch Breaking Bad. But then, of course, by the end of his time watching uh, Let's Call Saul, now he wants to watch Breaking Bad. So I thought R it would be resist fun. Resistance is futile. Sorry. That's exactly right. right. Yes. So I, I recently restarted from the beginning Breaking Bad. And I have to say, it is as good as I remember. It is just a very well-written, well-acted. It's a great great show and i i think that where you fall on walter white says a lot about you as a person because i know <laughs> <For> sure <laughs> i know that there are a lot of people out there who just idolize him like yes it, and anna gunn took a lot of abuse and um online like death threats even for being Was the, she skyler yeah skyler yeah. Mm. and i think that He's just an awful, terrible person. <laughs> the way, well, he is the by the end. Like, by the end of the show, he's definitely earned his place in hell. And, you know, like, yeah. I think but at it, the beginning, it, you know, you, you can really feel for that guy. And it's just all the little things over the course I, of the show. I, I, that, you know, I was just going to say, the way he sells his soul piece by piece, right? Yeah. It's just... Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not really one big crazy. thing, yeah. Yeah, but no, I, 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 I have to say, I mean, I'm a... <clears throat> I'm a screenwriter. It's like no, I I hated yeah. him from the moment the uh, show no. started. Go no, ahead. No, no, keep but, going, but keep I, going. But I'm a I'm a screenwriter, right? And I have to say that they should do clinics and classes based on that first pilot episode. Oh my god! Because hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean that the, the I mean every episode is brilliant, but the way that pilot episode sucks you in and pretty much sows every seed you're going to watch for the next few seasons, I think yep. is brilliant. Totally agree. And I agree with everything you just said, except the way that Walt treats Jesse from the jump is so demeaning. It's so degrading. It's so like just mean the way that he speaks to him, the the teacher student dynamic and the failing student, you know, yeah. teacher dynamic. It's it's I think that that is the, the glimpse that you need into who Walter really is. And that's how he finally gets to be by the end. Truly going to hell yeah so I, I haven't watched the early seasons nearly as recently as you so i could be totally off about this but i think i saw that as like i don't want to say he thinks he's better than him but he totally like, you does. know he's he's like the good upstanding person whereas jesse is like you know the the meth dealer you know like yeah. so that's probably where that comes from in the beginning and, mm. and you know over the course of time maybe like he's just used to treating him that way yeah this is something interesting for you to kind of keep track of while you're watching it i uh, i read somewhere a long time ago that walter white's general um 
like the the color of his outfits gets darker and darker and darker as like the series goes on just to kind of match like you know the the piece by piece selling of his soul this is definitely one of those shows you know you said it was like one of the best it it absolutely like we i'm gonna give mike a little spoiler here later in the show you're gonna be asked a question like what is the greatest television show ever made and a lot of people pick breaking bad you know it's um it's it's one of those shows that's just yeah it's Mm. brilliant yeah mike what do you got yeah what are you watching well, you know, just a disclaimer here, my uh, youngest daughter just moved to Hoboken, so we're officially empty nesters. So my wife and I are just in a binge, binge. Yeah. <laughs> so nice. we're watching everything. So I don't know if you saw that Showtime comedy, I Love That For You. It's got Vanessa Bayer and Molly oh, Shannon. Oh, no. But I, I actually, heard... I, I watched it on a plane. I had a business trip to Frankfurt and I watched it on the plane on the way home. And it was so funny. And hmm. it was so well written. And they're they're wondering if they're going to bring it back for a season two. I hope they will. And it's basically Molly Shannon and Vanessa Bear are uh, like home shopping network hosts and all the hmm. backbiting that's going on. And and oh, it's just like Molly Shannon's like been on the show for 30 years as a home shopping network. But she's actually a hoarder and she's kept everything she's ever sold for the 30 <laughs> years. It's so funny. I hope I didn't give that away. But I thought from a comedy perspective, that was really great. I mean, who hasn't binge watched The White Lotus, right? Season one and season two. I haven't, two. haven't yet. Oh, it's it's so I good. I hear great things with Jennifer yes. Coolidge. It, it, it's yes. so, so good. And that's somebody that, again, like Breaking Bad, all the seeds that are going to sow are in the first episode. And then you watch it all unfurl. I, I'm always a fan of things like that. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier, Vinny and I, I think we're both comic book nerds. I can see yeah. the Superman mm-hmm. behind him. So <laughs> I'll have to expand out the thing just for this moment. So you can I, see I, it. I'm em- I'm embarrassed to say at 50, at the tender age of 56, I still watch cartoons and comics and, and, uh, and Titans <laughs> Titans on HBO max was, uh, was, was, was pretty good. It was the uh, Nightwing uh, Robin wrestle as he becomes Red Hood. And, yeah. and again, you'll I'll, I'll pause for a second while everybody Googles what I just said, because, uh, you know, I Nightwing just went... was the original Robin. If exactly, you read comics exactly. in like the 1940s and, I, and 50s, he grew up and he became Nightwing. And I then just... Red Hood was the second Robin right. who theoretically died and came back to life and then became Red Hood. Yeah, there you go. That's I, that, You don't need to Google it now. There you go. But, uh, but but it it's kind of sad that you know that it's even sadder than I know that because I think I'm a little older <laughs> than you. But anyway, yeah, so I did that as well. So White Lotus, Titans, um, I love that for you. And I'm also starting to... Um, Man, you really fi- are on a binge bench. <laughs> I am. I like it's it. Sad. It's sad. And then I'm firing up Succession as well because the new season's coming soon. So I definitely want to like remember what happened. I'm not going to do the whole last season, but just the last couple of episodes. So I'm primed. But sure. or, normally I'm not. I'm. I'm. I have to say I don't watch a lot of TV, and I'm. A, I'm a writer, uh, so I do a lot of writing when I'm not uh, doing everything else. So it is rare. I don't know if I would have had many answers for you this time last month if you asked me. But again, we're in a period of uh, transition here in the house, and sure. I just find myself binge watching a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Then what are you watching? So I just finished, um, I have no idea how long ago it came to Netflix, but the last season of The Walking Dead finally hit Netflix. They usually do about a year, I guess, after the the thing ended. Um, So I am way off the cultural zeitgeist. But to be fair, The Walking Dead really hasn't been like major cultural zeitgeist since like season four or five. Like that, you know, another AMC show, just like Breaking Bad, it was their flagship show for a while there. And it was you know, one of the best shows that was ever made in that first three or four seasons. And then they did one of those things. Um, we talk about it a lot on this show when it happens. Um, in Arrow, when they introduced Damian Dark and Flash, when they introduced Zoom, like they, they introduced some major overpowered villain that just gets so boring after a while, you know, and they really stretched that out for like two, three seasons until their viewership just kind of caved through the floor. But they went on for 11 years and uh, I'm not going to say that the last season was bad. It was, they definitely found a nice way to kind of like, you know, send everybody off in, in the world that they live in, you know, the, the best possible outcome, but it, it was the last episode was just too um, focused on setting up three different spinoffs that they're going to do that. It was just like, eh, so are the zombies gone? What is the resolution? No, they're always going to have to deal with the zombies. It's like, the, um, 
it, the whole basis of the show is that it was a zombie apocalypse that will never end. Like it, it, we just get overtaken so quickly that there's just no way we're ever going to be able to reestablish ourselves. Um, so, or at least defeat them. Cause it, um, it's like this that virus like, that lives in everyone. Sounds so, like, a, sounds like our political system. I mean, I mean, there were times where there were. Am I, am I in the like, wrong podcast, by the way? <laughs> not allowed to talk politics. No, we're not allowed to get like too specific about politics. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I wasn't specific at all. I just. I think like, that's actually the only directive we've ever been given. Like you know, like, <laughs> and I just broke it. I broke it yeah. two minutes in. Oh. No, we can we can do, we can say that certain shows like this happen to be like you know, um, what do you call it? allegories or whatever. But um, yeah. no, I think in in the last few years, like the walking dead, I mean, it, it's really just been limping along. I mean, Andrew Lincoln, who plays the main character left a couple of seasons ago. Um, I can't remember her name, but the actress who plays Michonne, who was like the second lead left the show. Um, and, and when you have like all the main people leave the show, it's just like, what, what do you, what are you still going for? You know? Yeah. So yeah. it's a bummer, but yeah, that's what I was binging. Um, but yeah, it, it's good to kind of be done with it. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, sounds like yeah. it. Yeah, but with with you know zombies aside, <laughs> Mike, what do you do at Career Letters? So Career Letters, what we do is it's a wide umbrella, but we call it professional branding, right? So the professional branding could be individuals, and it could also be companies. So, uh, and if you have a question as to whether or not you might be sort of interested in career branding you want to ask yourself one question. If you landed on your LinkedIn profile, is that what you'd want your clients to see? Or is that what you'd want a customer to see? Or is that what you want somebody that's thinking about working under you to see, right? Because that's really the gateway when you're doing, I'm sure as you were looking to research me before I came on board in the podcast, where do you go? You would probably go to LinkedIn and you go on some of the socials. So that really is the epicenter of people's professional brands. So you want to really take a look at, is that, is it up to date? Is it current? And is that evocative of what you want people that are interested in doing business with you again, as a customer, as a boss, as somebody that's looking for a job? Is it is it doing all that for you? So that's the the lar- the short answer. And then when you go a little bit underneath that, you know there are obviously we're in the, an unprecedented job market uh, dynamic right now, right? Where we just saw in the month of January alone, I think it was about sixty thousand tech employees have been laid off with all of the the Googles, the Alphabets, the Net, Amazon, et cetera. Yeah. So it, you know it. The job market has been continually shifting since the pandemic, especially. So one of the things that is a competitive advantage in the job market is things like LinkedIn and things like Indeed, where you can leverage the analytics and it's all bots there, just like anything else, right? AI analytics. You can leverage those analytics and bots so that you can actually look to attract that next job that you want. So typically what people, the common mistake that people do on their resumes and their LinkedIn profiles is they're going to do a catalog of, okay, here's where I worked and here's what I did. And and I'm going to post that on LinkedIn. I'm going to put that on my resume. That's fine because it is a cataloging of what you did, right? But with the analytics, you want to pick up on the keywords and descriptives of the next job you're looking for right. and make sure that you bake that into your resume and your LinkedIn profile so that the, the bots and the AI on LinkedIn, there's a jobs, a suitcase icon on LinkedIn. And that's where LinkedIn dumps all the jobs they think you'll be interested in. So if you leverage that in a certain way, rather than having you go out and doing all the hard work on looking for a job, as an example, why don't you have LinkedIn help you find that job, right? So that's kind of a little bit of what we do. And if you would just permit me one example. Yeah. um, You know, and I tell people that 
it's very important on your LinkedIn profile, on your resume. It's one thing for you to have an opinion of what you did in your job. It's another thing for people to understand what does the industry say about what you do. So as an example, I had this one client, Jersey boy from Freehold, New Jersey. He found himself in a third level market on TV. He was a reporter, right, in Georgia. And he wanted to move up back here to be with his family or maybe up into New York. So what I did was I looked at all of the job descriptions at NBC and CBS and all the major networks. And I realized they're almost the same one. They basically cut and pasted those job descriptions. From no need of- to reinvent the wheel. Right? Right. So, so, that, so then I went back to the client and I said, here's what the industry has to say about what you did. Do you, did you do all this stuff? And he goes, oh, of course I did. I said, well, none of that's on your resume. So that's an example of where you go out to the market and see what the industry has to say about what you did in that role for you to attract those kind of roles in other markets as in his case that he wanted to be in. So that's an example of what we do. Uh, And then from a company corporate perspective, you know, let's take a look. This is your major uh, billboard now, right? And I'm holding my iPhone for people that are not mm. are, are not viewing this. So your iPhone is basically the billboard. So many of your, your customers' decisions are gonna be made based on what they see on this small, tiny billboard. So every word and every syllable counts. And sometimes, especially small business owners, they're so passionate about their business that they want to put a million little details about their their value proposition, but you have to boil that down to a couple of sentences. And with all due respect for small business owners, they're usually terrible at that. Mm-hmm. I, I, li- I like to tell people that you can't see your label when you're inside your own jar. So that's why you really want to have to somebody to come in and objectively look about what are the two or three sentences or concepts that you want to attract a customer with and then click here for more information. If they want that more information, great. You'll have all, I'm sure you'll have all the detail for them, but what's that hook that you're looking to uh, hook them in with, so to speak? Um, That's that's what we do as well. Uh, What's interesting is that our sister company is called Love Letters Profile. So I do... I write dating profiles for people, right? I know, don't ask. But it, <laughs> but it is, it's very similar, right? Because you want that first sentence to make somebody laugh and say, hey, we might have a chemistry here. Let me click and, and you know, swipe right or whatever the kids do. I'm married 30 years, I don't know. But, um, but it, it's not too dissimilar from uh, writing copy for a business or right. helping somebody find a job. You want that, you want to initially hook somebody in for an additional interest for them to look further. And that's what good writing does. And that's one of our big value propositions as well. I'll take a breath now. <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna say, I'd be amazed how many like marriages have started because you know you wrote some kind of like funny pickup joke in a profile. My, my, my most famous one is a Catholic cougar looks to Here we pray. Go. A Catholic, a Catholic cougar looks to pray, but it's P R E Y, yeah. not P R A Y. Right. So that that one uh, that one resulted in a marriage, and I've actually had one couple who have become dear <laughs> friends of mine. They actually, uh, I know, it Sorry, worked. I just snorted. That's uh, how hard I look. But uh, <laughs> but I, I we actually have a ninety day fiance situation where they met based on a dating profile and they married ninety days later. So. It works. Yeah. That's like a Dharma and Greg kind of situation, you know? Yeah. Wow. That's so scary. But it reminds me so much of the 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 jacket on a book or the back cover of a book. You know, that first sentence, when you're trying to figure out what your next read is going to be, you look at the uh, the back cover or the inside flap cover, and that first sentence makes a huge difference. And so why wouldn't it make a huge difference when it comes to dating profiles or job searches as well that yeah. it just makes so much sense or or the copy on your website right the copy yeah. on your website and, and a lot of times you know 
with all due, due respect for English teachers who, you know, by the way, made me who I, who I am today. Um, you know, a lot of people will be like, oh, I have an aunt that's an English teacher and she's a good editor. So she'll edit my copy. Or yeah. I have, a, I have a, I have a retired English teacher friend of mine that's in the resume business. And, you know, I, I, I'm tempted sometimes to put an advertisement out there for career letters that says we fix hundred dollar resumes because, there's so many people out there that are just good grammar people that are going to, yeah, take all, all the spelling mistakes out of your resumes, which of course, you know, it you don't important. want those in there. It is important, but it hasn't, there's analytics. There's, there's actually. You're chasing an algorithm, you know, that's, that's well, you're thing. chasing an al algorithm. But the other thing, which I find very interesting in what I do, again, it's the same for dating profiles as it is for, uh, for the career part is sometimes you just really actually want to ask the client, what do you want? What's important to you? What kind of work do you want? What kind of work do you not want? Yeah. What's your next step in three to five years? And then, you know, as Wayne Gretzky would say, you want to skate to where the puck is going. So it's, it's very much the same thing as like, okay, if we look two career, two job stops from now, what kind of career do you really want? And can we write, within your resume and your LinkedIn profile, the pathway to make it easier to get there, to get to that next level, and then the next level after that. So it's really a matter of stopping and asking for people what they want, what they don't want. You know, hey, I really miss the office. No, I don't want to go back into the office. I want to be remote. <laughs> Whatever that is for people, you know, uh, some people like the community of being in the office. Some people want to be remote. You want to take the time to ask that person what kind of a job they're looking for next. And I actually won't work with you until you figure that out, because why would I waste your money? I want to actually write what your next job is. I'm sorry. I want to write, I want to understand what your career pathing is and then write your LinkedIn profile and your resume to attract that. So I keep thinking about that line from into the woods where how do you know what to wish for until you get what you want and you see if you like it. I think for the Such longest- Such an awful movie. So Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> even start with me. What are you talking about? That's just- It's a terrible movie. I've heard that the play was very good, but the play movie is amazing. was terrible. It's my favorite. Mm. But anyway, mm. so I, I misquoted it. But my point is that for the longest time in my life, I didn't know what my career was supposed to be. I was, a, I was the, the thing that I went to school for is not what I do now. And I didn't understand- um, what I should be doing to get myself into the career that I probably should do. And I thought, what if I do all this work and I get to this, this place and I don't like it, you know? So I just wonder how many people are stymied by, um, you know, what does the next, what, remember the five-year plan? Remember when everybody was supposed to have a five-year plan? What if you don't know what your five-year plan is supposed to be? Cause you don't know if you're going to like it on the other side of that five years. And I wonder how many people are stymied by that and need coaching or, or I don't, I don't, do you know what I'm trying to say? I feel like I'm sure. saying it really badly. <laughs> sure. And I do some of that as well. Um, okay. So I do, I do some coaching on that as well. But I would, you know, my answer, my reaction to that would be, you know, there's plenty of people that I find that want to switch careers altogether. So I was in the medical device field and I now want to, well, here's a perfect example. Let me scratch that. Perfect example. We all know that this pandemic has been especially hard on teachers and educators. Yeah. And we all see them moving out in droves, right? So I have a lot of teacher clients that say, I now want to get into training and development, corporate development in, in the industry. And here I am, you know, I was, I was a business teacher in a high school for 20 years. And so again, okay, well, you don't know what company you want to be in. You don't want to be in an industry, but if you know roughly where you think you want to end up, well, then again, we're going to go into that industries and say, what do they look for in a corporate developer, a, a corporate training and development, I should say. So you have that list and then you compare that to what's the typical job description of a teacher. And to the extent that you can graft your previous experience into what they're looking for now in that role, yeah. that's something I can help you with. Now, 
you know, we all have, I mean, listen, I'm in my fifties and I'm still, I'm still dwelling in the inquiry of uh, what do I want to be when I grow up? Right. You know? So, I mean, yeah. I, I think you're always, and especially, you know, depending on what ages we're, we're all at. Right. I mean, I have, I'm in a, personally, I'm in a situation now where, as I shared with you, my youngest daughter has, has fled the coop um, and I'm now an empty nester. And do I need this big house? Do I need to be doing this kind of level of work? Do I need to do this? Do I? So, you know, we're all, it, part of it is not just what do I want to do when I grow up, but where is my life now? It's a very different situation when you are young or younger with kids that you have, you're facing with college bills than somebody that's my age. So, you know, it, but you do have to have, you do have to spend time to talk with somebody to say, okay, well, roughly what, you know, do, do you want to have, am I asking people to have their life all planned out for the next 20 years? I am not. Who, who is? But if you're roughly, you know, I've always wanted to be in fashion and right now I'm an educator or, you know, I really always wanted to be this, you know, in business, but I always wanted to give back and become a teacher. It's again, taking a look at what you've got now in your current skill set, what can be applied and then managing the gap. So as an example, if you wanted to be a teacher, okay, well, you need a master's degree in education. Do you have that? No. Okay. Well, in the next three years, you you probably would want to get that. So yeah. it's a matter of doing a gap analysis based on where you think you want to be versus where you are now and managing that gap. And sometimes in that, in that career skills inventory that we do in career letters, a plan does emerge. Does that, cool. I was, that was yeah. a very that was a very long answer. The, the, the thing about Irish people is we make long stories longer. Does that, yeah. does that answer? The, what was the question? And did it's I? It's all answer? important stuff, though. You know, yeah. it's 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 good to get into detail because there's a lot of people out there that really struggle with this kind of thing. And it, you know, it's it's not even just a struggle. There's like depression that comes from you feeling like you're not in the place in your life you want to be, and the the I, I don't know the not knowing how to get there. So I think yeah yeah. It's, and feeling well, stuck, like feeling so stuck and not really knowing what to do next. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I mean, we talked about Titans and we talked about superheroes. So maybe I can, if you'd permit me a quick origin story. Like, sure. Uh, <laughs> Did you get very... doused in chemicals and struck by lightning or something like that? <laughs> a bit by a radioactive I got fire. it. I got to be chasing LinkedIn's algorithm. <laughs> I, I, I got doused in chemicals, which is why I have this big tan complexion. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the light here. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm a little pink. But anyway, <laughs> no, this, this career letters business started on one of the darkest days of my life. And um, it was back in 2020, July 2020. I was a VP for a Fortune a 100 company in the science area. And I lost my job. They just decided that they wanted to switch and course correct in the pandemic. So I lost my job and my wife had lost her mom on the same day due to the pandemic. So oh you lose your job and your mother-in-law on the same day. And by any, I don't care how happy and optimistic you are. And I am happy and optimistic. That is a crappy day. So I'm having a glass of wine on the porch and I was like, wow, like this is a really crappy day. And we, th we thought this is the end of June. So we have the back half of the year where we can either spend the time to mourn my job and the loss of my children's grandmother and my wife's mom. Uh, we can do that and we had the money to do it and nobody would begrudge us for it. Or this is a real opportunity to have some sort of a runway and create something. So the two things that I typically were asked about when people find out that I'm a writer, I'm a Fortune 50 VP, I've also done some, I've written some books that are funny. So, you know, if you're a funny writer, oh, can you help me, you know, punch up my dating profile? So I would be tasked to go to a bar and write those on the back of bar napkins. And then uh, other people would say, look, you're a hiring manager, so can you look at my resume? So... I would do that. So when I thought about the things that I was doing uh, anyway, I thought, well, I am a writer. Is there a possibility to make a full-time writing career out of doing these things? So I started to just put the shingle out there, so to speak, and there's been an influx of business. Now, what's been interesting is on the dating profile side, 
I was slammed with requests to do dating profiles because people were on their couch through the pandemic, swiping left and swiping right. But then when they gained all the weight and they were back in the dating profile, they're like, eh, I don't know how to do that. So my dating profile business has kind of gone like I'm sure way at first down. people were like, there's people that can help with that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. But um, but you know, it's so it's 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 kind of died off a little bit. But the, you know, obviously the the career part has been super consistent and if anything else it's on an upward trajectory because you know there's still spontaneous layoffs going on you know if you're in the first quarter of the year people typically wait for their bonuses to happen they cash out their bonus and then two weeks later they're out that creates job opportunities for people hiring freezes stop in october you know start in october in some cases so for people that are looking for a job in october okay great get your resume together now so that when january that money opens up you're there for it. So there, you could see rhythms and seasons of, uh, of job openings that you want to be ready to meet the moment when it happens. And of course, you know, I can preach this to your blue in the face. This is like the boy scout credo is be prepared. You know, it's not really optimal and ideal to be working on your professional brand when you're out of a job, you know, <clears throat> If you're out of a job now, that's one thing, you know, you, you have no choice, you got to do that. But for the people that are out there now and you're like, yeah, I'm really happy where I am, but geez, I should really look, work on my resume. That's the time to do it because yeah. you now have, you have the time for introspective. There's not the wolf at the door waiting for the bills to get paid. So I, I tell people that a couple of things, manage your professional brand proactively and then also it's like a garden, you want to tend to it. So if you've won an award at work, put that on your LinkedIn profile, you know, so you're always wanting to cultivate your professional brand. And also if you're, you know, a business, a small business, you want to always be cultivating your website with, you know, new customer feedback or an award you want. So your professional brand, be it a corporate brand or an individual brand is something you always want to be cultivating. Agree. I think on that note, we're going to take a quick break. Okay, we are back. Welcome. And it is now time for our lightning round, which today is brought to us by RWJ Barnabas. Mike, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. Favorite pizza topping? Sausage. Solid choice. Yeah. Solid choice. Yeah. At Pete uh, and Elders. At Pete and Elders in, in Neptune. Go. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Greatest TV show ever made. Ooh, I would say Mad Men. <gasps> yes. I would say Mad Men. I would say Succession. And I would also say Veep for comedy. Love Veep. Yes. Love yeah, that. for sure. Veep Great. is amazing. Yeah. Great choices. Kate's um, a big Mad Men fan. I, I liked it. I don't know. I, I, yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. I can watch it once a year, like from beginning mm -hmm. to end. It's great. Yeah. All right. This is the controversial cop one uh -oh. um how do you feel about the eagles going to the super bowl <laughs> <laughs> well you need to know that i've watched a grand total of about an hour of football in my life i'm just not a football person there we I'm go like, yeah i'm just <laughs> not I, i'm not I, i'm not so see i feel like even if you don't watch football or the super bowl or anything there Philadelphia fans in general make this important. Like yeah. well, course, you have to yeah. have an opinion on like an entire city burning down their city, whether yeah. they win or lose. Well, <laughs> well, typically I was, I was the guy, I'm the guy in corporate when everybody gets on Monday morning at nine o'clock and they talk about the games over the weekend, I throw cold water on it. I go, uh, the Eagles, they're the ones in the green tights. Are right. They? And everybody's like, oh, shut up. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Ladies same. and gentlemen, this has been the Super Bowl special for us. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. The Eagle. Yeah. The Eagles, they're birds, right? They're in green right. tights. I mean, that's how I know about it. But totally. Yeah. But by, by the way, my wife is was born in Kansas City. So and yeah. I, we do love can We do love us some Kansas City here. So sure. And I'll like say the, go I like, Kansas City. <laughs> I, but I like the color green. I'm Irish. I don't know what to do. It's a conflict. Uh, sure. <laughs> that's great. That's great reasoning. I love it. All right. Uh, moving on. Farthest from New Jersey you've ever been? Uh, the farthest New Jersey I've ever been has been uh, Germany 
Frankfurt, Germany, I would say is the farthest I've ever been uh, distance wise. And then the farthest, furthest I've ever been uh, in, in, um, emotionally, intellectually is we lived in Vermont for a couple of years and it was like, it's such a chill vibe up there. And I'm like, yeah. my cousin Vinny in New Jersey, I'm like, come on, come on. Yeah. Hey, yeah. that checkout line says 10 or less. You've got 11. Come on. You know, like you're, you're just trying to reconcile your, your Jersey. I like how Vermont is like, you know, emotionally like far more different than New Jersey than let's it say is, Germany. Though it, it <laughs> is. Yeah. It, it yeah. Is. I lived in Savannah, Georgia for two years and it's exactly the same. It once took me 20 minutes to get through a Taco Bell drive through the drive through to drive through the drive through yeah. yeah like yeah. it is it is just chill i wouldn't say it's chill it's just slow well it's interesting i just got back from say martin hence the pinkness of my skin and you know they were on caribbean time there so the meals would take like an hour an hour and a half to get out and we we landed in new jersey and we went to the broadway diner in bayonne and we like ordered eight and we're out in like 40 minutes that and that's right. we're conditioned in new jersey with our diners to you know, yeah. to yep. get with it, you know, and then you go to the Caribbean, they're like, we'll get it in an hour, Mons. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. So, there is a mindset that you can get far away from New Jersey, never mind geographic. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. All right. I think that was the lightning round, which today was brought to us by RWJ Barnabas. Great job, Mike. You did very well. Cool. So we like to, uh, we like to give advice to people on this show. So, would you have any advice you'd give to somebody that's looking at their LinkedIn profile right now as you're talking like, hold on, I got to spruce that up. Maybe just wants to make like, you know, that that low hanging fruit kind of a change. You know, what what do you think? Well, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So I would actually have your LinkedIn profile professionally done. So, you know, put on a jacket, put on a business outfit, whatever, that's kind of thing. You know, I've seen dark photographs that you can barely make out the face. I've seen like the guy with the big cowboy hat with the reflective glasses holding up a bass fish. Well, unless you want to be a professional fisherman, like, is that really what you want to put out there? And then of course there's the people that, you know, have the, the, the picture from, you know, 45 years or 45 pounds ago that uh, <laughs> you're like, you don't even look that that's not even, nope. you don't even look like that, you know? So, you know, take a, take a, take a well-lit, it doesn't have to be a professionally done, but that would help. Uh, it's definitely worth the hundred bucks or whatever a photographer is going to charge you. But I would definitely have a professional picture that matches the kind of job you're going for. Um, so, you know, put on a jacket if you want to be a VP or, or whatever, whatever's appropriate for the kind of job you're looking for. I'm sure relatively similar advice would apply for the dating side too. Exactly. Exactly. Well, especially, <laughs> especially for that, like, you know, the people look at, people look at the dating profile, like, that's new. <laughs> well, you know, especially if you're on Zoom, or if you're going to do a FaceTime date initially, there's no hiding it. If you're 56 years old, and you're gray, you know, yeah. it, it's a bait and switch. And then you start your, you start the relation up relationship off with something dishonest. So where's that going to get you when you think about it? So yeah, that's a whole other podcast, the dating stuff. Some of this, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, it's some of these dating profiles have been so hilarious and heartbreaking. And we were talking about TV shows a little bit earlier, just a little bit of a plug. I actually took some of those dating profiles and I made a TV series out of it called Love Letters Profiles. And it's won some awards at some film festivals. Oh, wow. I took I took a couple of real life dating stories that I got from this business and I made a script out of it and I entered it into the London Screenwriting Festival and it won Best Comedy. I'm like, wow. So I produced it and it's kind of uh it's getting gaining legs. So if anybody that's moving, anybody that's moving to Eatontown from Net, you know, Netflix folks are moving to Eatontown. Anybody that's interested in making a, a slightly skewered romantic comedy like Nip Tuck Meets Modern Love, have I got a script for you. That's awesome. amazing. And it's so we can't watch it anywhere. It's, it's you can. You can. You can. Where watch, can we watch you, it? You can just look up my name and love letters profiles on YouTube or something. There's at least there's at least a trailer. I might there might be the whole show. I'm not sure. Oh, I'm definitely All right, watching it. So let's say somebody watches that and they, they want to get a hold of you. Let's say somebody is looking at their LinkedIn or dating profile and wants to get a hold of you. How can they do that? Well, I do have a website, mikefarraher.com, M-I-K-E-F as in Frank, A-R-R-H-E-R. 
A-G-H-E-R.com. That's kind of all things, Mike. I have books. I have dating profiles. I have all these other things. I also moderate a memoir writing class at Monmouth University, my alma mater. So I have a lot of stuff going on, which I really love. But it's specifically for the career letters, it's careerletters.com. And the, um, the service is $295. And that's going to include uh, a reworking of your resume so that it conforms to the AI analytics um, and formatted in a certain way that the AI robot eyes aren't going to kick it off the pile. Yeah. Uh, we also have, um, and then it also includes a 30 minute Zoom consult with me to go over the resume or the LinkedIn profile to make sure that that's what you want to put out there. So it's it's a combination of a writing service, but it's also a little bit of a, a counseling to understand, again, what do you want and how do we write a mes- resume to attract that? That's very fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Love it. I'm so glad you were on the show today. Thank I'm you so, so much. I'm so glad I was as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you to our listeners, especially the subscribers. We really appreciate the support. Thank you to New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, the official sponsor of the show. They do home, auto, and workers' comp, so check them out if you need some updated coverage. And finally, one last massive thank you to Mike Fairhar with Career Letters for joining us today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.